So hello and welcome to this MPTL course entitled Feminist Writing. So we're looking at Charlotte Burke and Gilman's uh, story, The Yellow Wallpaper. So this will be the concluding lecture for that, for this particular text. And we'll see how uh, we, where we ended last time. It was a very uh, dramatic kind of a point where uh, the protagonist, the female protagonist, had locked herself um, in a room and had thrown the key away inside a garden, flow, uh, garden road outside and then waiting for the husband to come in. And then we said, we have seen already how in a very symbolic act of emancipation and subversion, she had taken out the wallpaper from the wall and then she discovered the woman behind the wallpaper. And then, you know, there's this degree of empathy that she is established with the woman figure in the wallpaper. And we've seen how at a structural level as well as at a functional level, uh, so her imprisonment or her, her lack of agency in terms of the wallpaper, in terms of the medical apparatus in which she's confined in, is very similar to the lack of agency suffered by the uh, female figure in the wallpaper. So when she takes to the wallpaper and symbolically emancipates the woman figure from the uh, patterns and, and the geometries that are there, uh, she symbolically emancipates herself. And then she locks herself in the room and she uh, waits for the husband to come and then we are told in a very interesting sense and a very loaded verb that I want to astonish him. So astonish, obviously, over here, it has a sense of um, retaliation, a sense of viscerality, a sense of violence about it. So you know, she wants to hit back, she wants to retaliate a little bit, uh, you know, and retaliate against all the um, sort of times in which she would have been present uh, medically, existentially, psychologically by the husband figure. And then she goes on to say, I've got a rope up here that even Jenny did not find. If that woman does get out and tries to get away, I can tie her. But I forgot I could not reach far without anything to stand on. This bed will not move. I tried to lift and push it until I was lame, and then I got so angry that I bit off a little uh, piece of one corner, but it hurt my teeth. So obviously this is getting very violent and visceral over here. And the violence and viscerality is part of the subversion package, is part of the subversion narrative that she is enacting over here. Then I peeled off all the paper I could reach standing on the floor. It sticks horribly and the pattern just enjoys it. All those strangled heads and bulbous eyes and weddling fungus growths that just shriek with derision. So we, we see how all the different inanimate things are now animated away and now animated at a violent level. Uh, so she's, she can see all the patterns and the, the strangled heads and bulbous eyes, almost like little chopped off heads uh, that she talks about away here. So obviously things get very violent and gory. Uh, in a very visceral sense, and then that makes uh, that that makes entire subversion narrative, the entire subversion act, a very very uh, visceral and violent act. And then she says how uh, all the strangled heads and bulbous eyes and waddling fungus growths just shriek with derision. So derision obviously is just this mockery and anger that she's been subjected to over here. Uh, and that's something which is making her even more angry. And then she says quite clearly over here, I am getting angry enough to do something desperate. To jump out of the window would be, would be a miracle exercise, but the bars are too strong even to try. So she wants to enact uh, agency over here. And we can see how the idea, the aspiration to enact agency comes to a very visceral and violent process. She wants to do it dramatically. She wants to do it uh, in a very theatrical way. And she wants to do it in a very... Uh, larger than life sense. She wants to jump from the window, do something spectacular. So there's a, there's a spectacular quality, there's a you know, difference in degree uh, in terms of what she wants to do. And that is making her, you know, you know, see the anger and at the same time this anger is part of the subversion uh, narrative, the subversion sentiment that she is uh, experiencing at the moment. Besides, I wouldn't do it. Uh, of course not. I know well enough that a step like that is improper and might be misconstrued. Uh, so she's stepping back from jumping from the window uh, she thinks she's improper and might be misconstrued, might be misunderstood. I don't like to look out of the windows even. There are so many of those creeping women and they creep so fast. I wonder if they all come out of the wallpaper as I did, right? So, you know, the whole idea um, begins to morph. So she morphs into the wallpaper and she says that the fact that I peeled out the wallpaper from the wall made me realize that I was in the wallpaper as well. So I was in a yellow wallpaper. So I was in this imprisonment, this prison of uh, medical manners, this prison of medical coercion, this prison of this collusion between medical science and patriarchy which had imprisoned me all the time. But I'm securely fastened now by my well-hidden rope. You don't get me out on the road there. So you know, I'm, f I'm, I'm securely fastened now by my well-hidden rope. You don't get me out on the road there. So obviously she's got a, she, she had a sense of rootedness now. She had a sense of anchorage now, uh, being tied to a rope. And now she's tying herself and she's enacting her own agency. In that, in that fashion. 
I suppose I shall have to get back behind the pattern when it comes night, and that is hard. It is so pleasant to be out in this great room and creep around as I please. So the whole idea of as I please becomes important over here, and that becomes an agentic act, the fact that she has the agency to roam around the room as she pleases. I don't want to go outside, I won't even if Jenny asks me to. For outside you have to creep on the ground and, and everything is green instead of yellow, but now she's having this uh, you know, affiliation to yellow. So as I mentioned already, what we see psychologically and experientially throughout this uh, the story is a movement from aversion to affiliation, from aversion to association. So now she associates herself with the yellow wallpaper uh, and she says, I want to be with this yellow wallpaper uh, rather than getting out on the green outside, which is something which I don't desire so much. But here I can creep smoothly on the floor and my shoulder just fits in that long smooch around the uh, wall so I cannot lose my way. Why? There is John at the door. It's no use, young man. You can't open it. How does it call and pound? Now it's crying for an axe. It would be a shame to break down the beautiful door. John, dear, uh, said I in the gentlest voice. The key is down by the front steps, under a plantain leaf. That silenced him for a few moments. So that's, that's, what, that's the place where she threw the key. And now she's instructing him from the inside to get the key at that particular point. Uh, because, you know, he's trying, he's threatening to break the door with an axe. And she doesn't want him to do that because she thinks it's a beautiful doll. So now what we see very clearly is the fact that she is the one who has control. She is the one who exercises control. The one, she's the one who uh, enacts and articulates control. And that makes her a, a agentic in quality compared to John. And also what we see very clearly and very soon is that how the entire ontology and experientiality of history will be shifted. It'll, it'll go to the male and as the story would end with the, uh, the man passing out. Uh, the great medical uh, manly doctor passing out uh, you know, and becoming literally hysteric in quality where she becomes completely in control and completely rational in her own sense of rationality. So that silenced him for a few moments. Then he said very quietly indeed, open the door my darling. I can't, said I. The key is down by the front door under a plantain leaf. And then I said it again several times, very gently and slowly, and said it so often that he had to go and see and if he got it of course and came in, he stopped short by the door. So, you know, and that's something that, you know, there's a climax moment in the story. What is the matter? He cried, for God's sake, what are you doing? I kept on uh, creeping just the same, but I looked at him over my shoulder. I've got out at last, said I. In spite of you and Jane, I'd have pulled off most of the paper, so you can't put me back. So, and you can see the whole idea is now morphing, uh, mapping onto each other. So she, essentially, she was a yellow wallpaper. Uh, and you know she kept looking at herself all the time with loath and you know disgust, and now she manages to come out of the yellow wallpaper, and now she declares emancipation. She declares uh, her freedom from the wallpaper and tells her husband quite clearly, "I've got out at last," said I, in spite of you and Jane, and I pull out the most, I pull up most of the paper, so you can't put me back. So you know I've come out of it, so you can't put me back. And in the final passage, the final uh, paragraph uh, in the story reads uh, in the following way. Now why should that man have fainted? But he did, and right across my path by the wall so that I had to creep over him every time. So if you notice, it's very, very loaded, the last, the last bit. Uh, John is referred to as that man. So, you know, that man, that stranger, the person who wanted to control me, the medical masculine person. Why should that man have fainted? So, you know, John faints in the end. So the, the entire uh, notion of understanding of hysteria is transferred back to the male over here. So why should that man have fainted? But he did, and right across my path by the wall. So, you know, he fainted right across my path by the wall. So I had to creep over him every time. So, you know, uh, she had to creep or step over him every time. So what we find at the end of the story is a complete reassertion of agency. Uh, and that reassertion of agency uh, in that private rationality, that completely hystericizes the male. Uh, so the great medical doctor who comes in, uh, you know, having tried to confine and coerce and cure uh, his wife for the longest time and now comes in and sees that she has taken out the wallpaper and he, she declares to him at the point that I've taken out the yellow wallpaper, you can't put me back there again. Uh, so the whole, the whole point becomes uh, a very symbolic act of emancipation, self-emancipation, a very symbolic act of subversion where, whereby she liberates herself from the wallpaper uh, and then you know that act of liberation, that assertion of liberation is what uh, makes the husband pass out faint. So and that concludes the story of course. But then you know if you read it, if you go back and summarize what the story is all about, uh, it's about a very alternative narrative of experience. 
uh, and that alternative narrative experience is something which situates a bit itself against the medical narrative of control, coercion, and cure, uh, which is uh, obviously uh, embodied by the husband figure over here. And as I may have mentioned already, uh, there's a there's a very clear allusion to Silas Weir Michelle, uh, who is this great American uh, you know, doctor who prescribed what is now called a rest cure. So rest cure would would, would include uh, confining the figure, confining the the hysteric, more often than not, the woman uh, in, a, in a room or in a house and feeding her with some very regular food just so she puts on weight, uh, etc. So it is obviously uh, confinement to a large extent. And the speciality of the skill method is something which is very, very important uh, because you, know, you can find that even throughout this course, uh, almost all the texts we have done so far, the fictional texts, uh, space has become a very important uh, issue. Uh, because you know, space generates identities, especially gendered identities. Uh, so the space which is uh, in which is situated away has very discursive space, is medically and medical discursively informed uh, space because that's where she is confined and contained and coerced. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of the story, uh, she manages to lock herself in a symbolic act of uh, claiming the space uh, to a large extent. So she claims the space. Uh, that in, in which she is situated, and then of course uh, she uh, symbolically takes out the wallpaper, and the wallpaper becomes uh, an allegory or a symbol of her own con containment and imprisonment in a masculine apparatus. Uh, so that becomes a very important factor over here as well, and that uh, that symbolic act of subversion uh, becomes, uh, in, a, in a way, a feminist critique of patriarchy, the feminist critique of the collusion between medicine and patriarchy, which is embodied by the husband figure over here, who happens to know everything, who happens to speak for the wife, uh, speak for the suffering wife, uh, and speak and you know and knows exactly what's good for her and what's not good for her. And that, that figure of authority, that figure of certainty, is something which is critiqued and uh, almost parodied over here in this particular story. So it's a very, very important feminist text, it's a very, very important piece of feminist writing because it situates itself against uh, the phallocentric principle uh, of cure and confinement and coercion. And we find something such as uh, something so seemingly benevolent such as medical cure uh, or medical treatment is actually quite discursively determined. So this discursive determination is something which is very, very important for us to understand and remember uh, as we read the story. Uh, and that, in a way, that yellow wallpaper becomes a very symbolic space in which the female is confined and contained, especially the unhealthy female. So again, uh, sickness becomes a discursive formation over here. So how sickness is uh, described and mapped, uh, how the sick body uh, is something which is looked at, is something which is gazed at. And that's something which you saw already in Silver Plot's poem Tulips, which we have covered already. So this particular uh, story, the yellow wallpaper and tulips are quite dialogue with each other in many ways because both are, both inhabit the protagonist and both um, Takes inhabit the um, a very important register uh, of embodiment, which is uh, sort of alternative rationality, alternative embodiment, and which wants to situate itself against the discursive dominant order of embodiment, which is obviously very, very phallocentric in quality, which is very, very uh, male centric in quality. Uh, and this collusion, like I said already, the collusion between patriarchy and medicine, uh, which subjects the female protagonist to rest cure, is something which is critiqued over here and parodied over here throughout the story. So that concludes the yellow wallpaper for us. Uh, and we find, and I'm sure you all understand how important a text it is from the perspective of feminist studies and how it connects to some of the concerns and debates we've been having generically about feminism and feminist writings, uh, about a reassertion of agency, about a ownership on agency, ownership on the motor mechanism of agency. Uh, and that's what happens in the end. And of course, the motor mechanism of agency extends onto a more existential frame of agency, which is then, of course, uh, uh, reclaimed at the end of the story. So that act of reclaiming is a very, very important way. And that reclaiming happens through a violent process, through a process of astonishment. So she wants to astonish the husband. It's almost like giving him an electric shock. So the word astonish can, can, can mean different things over here at this point of time. And of course, we see at the end, the, the husband does pass out as if she's been touched by a very, very high voltage electric um, you know, object. And he passes out and you know, he becomes hysteric. He becomes someone who crumbles uh, out of nervous exhaustion uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, seemingly out of nervous exhaustion. And then she says uh, she has to creep over him every time. So there's a very uh, open-ended kind of discussion, open-ended kind of conclusion. It's not really a conclusion because we don't quite know what happens to John 
does it die or does it just faint or does it come back and I know Marie is there to agency, his agency and does she go back, the female protagonist, does she go back to the wallpaper. So these are very, very open ended questions with which the story ends to which we have no concrete answers. But the point is the open endedness is part of the subversion package, the fact that it doesn't really fit into any rational narrative of closure is something that is very, very important. It doesn't really have a closure in that sense, it opens uh, into multiple possibilities of meaning which is what also at, at a very, very uh, uh, narrative level, it makes it a very, very strong feminist text. So with that, we conclude the Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman's, Gilman, and we, uh, I hope you enjoyed reading it with me. Uh, and so just go through all the important sections which we've covered so far in, in this particular uh, series of lectures. Uh, and you know, I'm sure we'll be able to find out how it fits into the broad narrative of feminism and feminist writings, which we're exploring in this course. So we conclude with uh, uh, the Yellow Wallpaper with that, and we move on to new text for the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.